Hello, everyone, and welcome to Police Off the Cuff, Real Crime Stories. I'm your host, retired NYPD Sergeant Bill Cannon, a 27-year veteran of the NYPD. You know, as the world looks on at this horrific terrorist attack that occurred in Moscow at this concert hall, the Crocus Concert Hall, we always bring it back to a personal level. And what do I mean by that? Well, could that happen in New York City? And guys, you know something? The 1993 World Trade Center bombing, you remember that? A U-Haul truck went into the basement, into the parking garage, and almost had enough dynamite, firepower in that U-Haul truck to take down the building. It did not. That was the first attack in 1993. And of course, 9-11, which I and my co-host tonight, Mike Geary, Mike Geary were first responders. And that incident that day, that infamous day, September 11, 2001, will stay with us and every other New Yorker for the rest of our lives, you know. And then there was another one that maybe didn't get as much as attention. In 2010, there was an attempted bombing in Times Square. And if it hadn't been for the ineptitude of the bomber, uh, that not studying bombing 101 and 102, it smoked up and flared out, and they were able to disarm it or defeat it before it went off. And the guy was so inept that he used his own car with his own license plate numbers, and he just tracked them, and he attempted to flee the country. So that was the third one. Then there's been other terrorist attempts and terrorist attacks in New York City, and I don't want to list all of them. But because it happened in Moscow, should that raise all level of fear? That's what the goal of a terrorist is, to induce fear, right? And should it raise all level of awareness? The old adage, if you see something, say something. 100% it should. And if we're stupid enough not to take this as a warning, and not to up our own level of security, and not to up our level of awareness as New Yorkers, as any other place where large amounts of people gather. You know, New York City, they, they call them soft targets. Soft targets. Lincoln Center, Madison Square Garden, Carnegie Hall, all kinds of concert halls throughout the city restaurants, bars. Can you protect all of them? No, but that's where the eyes of the community, the eyes of, of everyone, will help prevent the next terrorist attack, the next Moscow Crocus Theater. Even at Mumbai uh, in 2008, terrorist attack at a shopping mall. And over four days, they couldn't stop them because they didn't have the ability to do so in Mumbai. For four days, they killed people. 175 people were killed. Hopefully, that would not be a problem in New York City. But if they keep beating down on the police and not have enough resources to train for things like this and to do things like not give the police the training and the personnel they need, because their number one job is to protect us, to protect the public. Folks, hold on to your seats. True crime from a police perspective. You're about to enter the off-the-cuff zone. The police off-the-cuff zone. There has to be some common sense. Yes, sir. They have the car stopped in Tampa Ranch, Michael Biden. We still don't know who pulled the trigger.
ISIS-K, a group tied to Moscow attack, has grown bolder and more violent. The militant group violently opposes the Taliban leaders of Afghanistan, where it is based. It is increasingly targeting foreign foes. Uh, few know, this is according to the New York Times, few know better than the Taliban what a relentless foe the Islamic State's affiliate in Afghanistan can be. Much of the West considers the Taliban, which reclaimed power in the country in 2021, to be an extremist Islamic movement. But the Islamic State, Khoraz Khorasan, the affiliate that has been linked by U.S. officials to the terrorist attack in suburban Moscow on Friday, has slammed the Taliban government, calling the group's version of Islamic rule insufficiently hardline. The Islamic State Khorasan, or ISIS-K, is one of the last significant antagonists that the Taliban face in Afghanistan. It has carried out a bloody drumbeat of attacks throughout the country in recent years, seeking to use the violence to undermine the Taliban's relationships with regional allies and to portray the government as incapable of providing security in Afghanistan. In months after the Taliban seized power, ISIS-K carried out near daily attacks on their soldiers at roadside checkpoints and in neighborhoods that are home to the country's Hazara ethnic minority. The following year, ISIS-K fighters attacked the Russian embassy in Kabul, tried to assassinate Pakistan's top diplomat to Afghanistan, and sent gunmen into a prominent hotel in Kabul that was home to many Chinese nationals, seeking to undermine the Taliban promise of restoring peace. More recently, ISIS-K's attacks have grown bolder and stretched beyond Afghanistan's borders. The group killed at least 43 people in an assault on a political rally in northern Pakistan in July. It killed at least 84 people in two suicide bombings in Iran in January. Now U.S. officials say ISIS-K was behind the attack in Moscow, which killed at least 33 people. Joining me on tonight's show to discuss the ramifications of this attack and how it can possibly affect us here in the U.S. is retired NYPD Sergeant Professor of Criminal Justice at Albertus Magnus College in Connecticut. Attorney, welcome to the show. Michael Geary. Mike, welcome to the show. Good evening, Bill. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for having me on. You know, Mike, whenever I hear or see about these terrorist attacks, and again, you know, not to pat ourselves on the shoulder, but both of us were 9-11 first responders. And we understand in a real sense, in a real serious sense, that yes, some of these terrorists are already here. They're in this country. They're absolutely in this country. Are they laying back and waiting for the right moment to strike? And I don't want me to wish to strike or create fear. It's just a reality. And we learned in New York, if you see something, say something. And that's the mantra for New York City. But how about everywhere else, Mike? Billy, we know they're here. Maybe not all of them, but enough are here. We've had um, uh, really very little security at the border. You know, millions have come across Chinese at, uh, people from all over the world. There's probably not a single country that isn't hasn't been represented by these people. Um, it, it is a very scary state of affairs because you know we're, we expect our law enforcement to protect us. And at the border, that's our first ability, our first opportunity to do this. Um, even with the border the way it is, we is, they've actually come across a number of people on the terrorist wanted list. I think it's, the number is over 100 now. So that's the number that have been caught. Uh, I fear the number that are, have actually come across. Um, the the uh, bombing if you, you uh, in uh, the World Trade Center in 1993, that was well planned. Everybody knew they would try it again, and they did in 2001. Um, there was an old saying I remember about the first uh, time when we went into Afghanistan, and uh, the saying was that, yeah, the Americans have the watches, but we have the time. These people can sit quietly for years upon years upon years to perfect a plan. And uh, it doesn't have to be sophisticated. It just ha has to be bloody. So we have to be very careful. 
You know, Mike, and it's hard to believe that um, someone will go into a soft target, in this case, a um, concert hall, and just start shooting people and taking human lives that easy as if they're swatting a fly. Mm -hmm. But yet we know that there are those, there are terrorists, there are people, there are extremists who will do this. And because there are those type of people, people in this world, we must be prepared. And by we, I mean American law enforcement. I mean the NYPD. I mean the Nassau County Police. I mean the Suffolk County Police. I mean all police departments in New York State. You must be prepared for this. And not just New York State, throughout the country. Because right. you know who's going to thwart these terrorists? Not the military. No. Local law enforcement, the people that city council members are beating up all the time. Those right. are the guys that are going to run in as the city council's running away. You know, they're going to run in and they're going to defend people and they're going to risk their lives to save citizens of New York and citizens of Albany, citizens of Buffalo, wherever that police department is, because we're all cut from the same cloth. And they're the ones that are going to be the first responders. They're going to be the first ones on the scene if anything like this could, does happen in the United States. Billy, it's not a matter of if, it's always a matter of just when. And just think of it. Uh, these uh, Afghanis and these, these splinter group, the K group, they are willing to kill their own people from their own region of the world, their own religion. Could you imagine what they want to do to the Jews and Christians in America? People who they have absolutely no feeling other than hatred for, for what we visited upon them for the last 20 years. They probably are just chomping at the bit, waiting for the time to strike. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when and, and where. And just think about it when people are driving. Uh, what are the so soft targets? Buses, trains, schoolyards, concert halls, you know, football games, baseball games. With You know, it doesn't matter. They're looking for the numbers. They want to, you know, they don't want to just shoot one person. They can go to the middle of Times Square and just with an AK-47, just start shooting. Um, these are the kinds of things that um, scare law enforcement and uh, law enforcement thinks about this stuff 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And um, we have to be hyper vigilant. So, yes, if you anyone ever sees anything, don't worry about political correctness. Make a phone call. You have to do that. 100 percent. Let me play this from News Nation, Mike. Tracking the very latest after a deadly terror attack inside a Russian concert hall. At this time, 133 people are dead after gunmen opened fire on the venue, with the Islamic State now claiming responsibility. News Nation correspondent Alina Shirazi live in D.C. tonight as we learn the latest details, including that U.S. intelligence warned Russia that ISIS militants were determined to target that country. Alina, what are we learning? Well, Natasha, the White House, like you mentioned, confirmed with the United States that the government actually warned Russia that ISIS militants were planning to target them, but Vladimir Putin shrugged that off. He even called it blackmail. So a warning, some of the video you're about to see here is graphic. <laughs> It's the worst terrorist attack on the Russian capital of Moscow in decades. Camouflaged gunmen stormed a popular concert hall, opening fire and throwing a firebomb. People screaming, ducking behind seats as gunshots echoed. The attack killing over 130 people and counting as more bodies are found in the rubble. Video showing the chaos that took over as flames engulfed City Hall. Smoke billowing from the roof as the building collapsed. Terrorists ISIS-K claiming full responsibility for the attack. <laughs> Military and foreign policy experts in Washington tell News Nation that ISIS-K has been focused on Russia, frequently criticizing Vladimir Putin. Today, Russia's president announcing the arrest of 11 people tied to the attack, including four gunmen suspected of carrying out the shootings. In his speech, Putin called the attack a barbaric act of terrorism, vowing to punish the perpetrators. All four direct perpetrators of the terrorist attack, 
all those who shot and killed people were found and detained. They tried to hide and were moving towards Ukraine, where according to preliminary data, a passage was prepared for them on the Ukrainian side to cross the state border. The Department of State responding to the violence saying, the United States strongly condemns yesterday's deadly terrorist attack in Moscow. We send our deepest condolences to the families and loved ones of those killed and all affected by this heinous crime. We condemn terrorism in all its forms and stand in solidarity with the people of Russia in grieving the loss of life from this horrific event. And Putin declared tomorrow as a national day of mourning for the victims. He also said more security measures have been added throughout the country as a result of what happened. Thank you. ISIS-K, for those that uh, are asking in the chat, it stands for isis Khorasan. They're a more militant group that actually is against the Taliban and against Russia, of course. That's why this attack was carried out. But look, all these splinter terrorist groups pop up based on the politics in the region. And look, we're obviously not very popular in Afghanistan. So things like this, we must be diligent in watching and seeing what could possibly happen in our country. And when someone attacks, a, uh, as you see on the screen there, a concert hall of Innocent people, helpless people, people going out for a good time. Uh, it's a scary situation. And then not only did, did they attack it, but they set it on fire. And I would, I would imagine that many people died from smoke inhalation, not even from getting shot, right. from uh, breathing in smoke. And that's how most people die in fires is not from the fire, from the smoke. So it, it's, it's a horrific situation. Um, the U.S. State Department did warn Russia uh, on March 7th. Uh, the U.S. State Department issued a rare specific public warning on people to avoid large gatherings, including concerts, uh, due to the, um, in, the information that extremists had imminent plans to target such events in the Russian capital. So it's not uncommon that we notify Russia, who is an adversary of ours, and that they in turn also notify us sometimes mm -hmm. of potential terrorist acts. And Mike, we spoke before we went on the air, and you mentioned the Zarnayev brothers. You want to talk yeah. about that? Yeah, in 2014, uh, about six months before, eight months before the uh, 2015 Boston Marathon bombing, the Sarnayev brothers traveled from the United States over to, um, uh, you know, the Middle East and then over to, uh, I think it was the Chechnya or Kazakhstan, and they crossed the border and um, they were picked up on intelligence from the Russian uh, version of Homeland Security. And since they were had American you know, uh, they were, had uh, American citizenry. One of them was American citizen. Um, uh, I'm not sure if it was the younger one or the older one, but uh, they picked that up and they notified our own Homeland Security. And unfortunately, um, yeah, our own Homeland Security um, may have not really paid attention too much. They dropped the ball, I'm not really sure. But Tarnaya brothers weren't being watched when they came back to the United States. You think that they could have been watched. And as soon as they w came in from an international flight, uh, we would have the ability to track them, but we didn't. So Russia and America, no matter what we say politically, and we can land base each other you know, on the internet, and sometimes our militaries aren't really uh, working, uh, sometimes working against each other. Um, there are parts of our government that do cooperate with people who you would think are are sworn enemy because there are third uh, parties out there that would like to actually harm both Americans and Russians. And so this this is a, a very interesting piece of information that we actually uh, work um, somewhat closely with the Russians. They warn us and we warn them when we see terrorists uh, come across the borders. 
You know, Mike, I believe the Zorneyev brothers, their names were Tamerlan and Zokor. That's right. That's right. And I believe the oldest one was Tamerlan. And he was the one that trained at a terrorist camp in Chechnya. Yes, yes that's right. That was, that was reported to the FBI. And for whatever, and I, I believe he was actually an FBI informant. Oh. So, cool. however, I'm not pointing the finger yeah. at anyone, but however that went down, we knew about that. <clears throat> And somehow the ball was dropped. Yeah. And the old see something, say something didn't occur. Right. This is some video uh, that was released by the Islamic State on the Friday's attack. This is supposedly one of the shooters. We don't know for sure he's being walked up by a, a Russian soldier. Uh, we don't know for sure they got the right guys, um, but they made four arrests right away, um, which would, of course, be a great thing because not only do you, will you have the people responsible, but you'll find out who hired them and who was behind this, who financed this. So all of those things are quite important. Um, I'm sure Russian soldiers handle their prisoners a lot less gingerly than we do in the United States. Yeah, I don't think there's any such thing as a civilian complaint in this situation. No, I don't think so either, especially after what occurred here. Uh, it seems like they're going through some of the evidence. Uh, just just a, a horrific situation. I'm going to take it off the sc yeah. screen right now. But um, th this this situation, when we speak about uh, soft targets and, and things like that, and could it happen in this country? Yes. And, you know, we talk about diligence. One of the things after 9-11, uh, the NYPD under Ray Kelly, uh, they founded... Uh, the Joint Terrorist Task Force and the Counterterrorism Task Force, both were integrated with NYPD officers and the FBI. And some of the officers, the first time officers from the NYPD actually worked overseas. Right. There were officers in Afghanistan and there was in Israel, uh, Iran, Iraq. There were cops all over uh, Cuba, of course, Guantanamo Bay. And this was all to have you know, our fingers on the pulse of what was going on because New York City was the number one target. So Ray Kelly, to his credit, the old Marine that he is, uh, decided he wanted firsthand reporting right. from NYPD officers directly to him what was going on. He didn't want to leave it to the feds to let him knowing know what was going on in his city. So as such, he had NYPD officers working right alongside the FBI with the Joint Terrorist Task Force. Billy, it's good. It's a good move because you know it saves time. We don't have to worry about getting treated like little the little kid brother to the FBI and waiting for them to prioritize information. Because there are times where they they will uh, engage in long term surveillance, long term investigations. Of, of criminals like under RICO and things like that. And they won't actually notify the NYPD at all. And, and you know, and uh, if you ask for information, they won't give it to you. So it was excellent idea by Ray Kelly, because this way, if one of our detectives gets information in Afghanistan or Israel or any other place, they can just send it right back, right through our own channels, rather than begging uh, the CIA, FBI, any other federal agency, Homeland Security, you know, the, the, the alphabet of uh, 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 organizations under the umbrella of Homeland Security, uh, it could take who knows how long to get vital information where it can be used and need, where it's needed. So that was an excellent thing to do. And I hope over the years that has actually thwarted uh, some plans that terrorists may have had for attacking New York City.
100%. Let me play this from Fox News here. In Russia at a concert hall. We are learning more information and also getting our first look at some suspects inside of the courtroom. This a tweet right now from the Associated Press saying the suspects in this Russian concert hall attack that killed more than 130 people mm. have arrived in court in Moscow. And of course, we saw just some brief images of this scene inside the courtroom as the suspects, which left more than 130 people dead, were there in this district court. And there was, of course, a heavy police presence there on hand, which is expected to determine pretrial restrictions of the men who are suspected of opening fire on crowds of concert goers in the suburban city hall on Friday. You can see one of these suspects was led blindfolded into the courtroom. His blindfold was moved and a black eye was visible behind the glass. The attack, which claimed by an affiliate of the Islamic State group, is the deadliest on Russian soil in years. Russian authorities arrested four suspect attackers on Saturday, with seven more detained on suspicion of involvement in the attack. Russian President Vladimir Putin said the nighttime address to the nation on Saturday. He claimed they were caught while fleeing to Ukraine, something that Kyiv firmly denies. Family and friends of those still missing waited for news of their loved ones as Russia observed a day of national mourning on Sunday. And you can see this just kind of loop here because we didn't get much of a look inside of the courtroom of this one individual right there. Events at cultural institutions were canceled. Flags were lowered to half staff and television, entertainment and advertising were suspended as a steady stream of people added to also a makeshift memorial near the burnt out concert hall, creating a huge mound of flowers as rescuers continued to search the damaged building and the death toll rises. Even more bodies were found. Some families still don't know if the relatives who went to the event targeted by gunmen on Friday are alive. Moscow's Department of Health said Sunday it has begun identifying the bodies of those killed and it will take several weeks to determine all of that. The U.S. also shared information with Russia in early March about a planned terrorist attack in Moscow and issued a public warning to Americans in Russia. Uh, of course, this is just images inside of the courtroom. One of the suspected uh, terrorists there uh, on this attack there in Russia as we're getting our first look. Not a ton of information out of there as we're obviously determining it in Russia, a very complicated region, a very different court system than here in the United States. So, of course, the suspect in the concert hall attack that killed more than 100 people, 130 people arrived at court in Moscow. We got like so uh they've caught they've arrested four of them um that you saw one of them on the screen i don't know how quickly they'll put be put to death i'm sure they won't get they won't get what we would call a fair trial but uh putin is already trying to connect the attacks to ukraine sure uh sure. saying that you know our state department is saying this is isis k ISIS Khorasan, and we explained they're from Afghanistan. Uh, but Putin, for political reasons, is trying to tie them, say that they're supported by Ukraine and the West, meaning the United States. And that, you know, that's not good for um, public relations, obviously. And uh, I don't think that's true. Uh, I think that they obviously are. Uh, Afghanistan, they're they're against the Taliban. Uh, it's a, it's a uh, an organization of terrorists, of extremists that all of the alphabet units, CIA, FBI, Homeland Security, they all know about them. And you know, during the whole terrorist stuff with 9/11, they used to say they would hear stuff and on the internet, and they would call it chatter. Because there's actually people watching and listening all over the internet that are agents, that are CIA agents, FBI agents. Local police has their own computer units. And they're watching what's going on. And they would hear chatter that they would tie to terrorist groups planning attacks. And in this instance, they did have a warning. And March 7th, they told Russia... They gave this information to them. And look, you can't protect every soft target in your country. But I think that if I was a citizen and I was told to avoid concert halls and uh, 
sporting arenas, I think I would do so. I think I'd stay away. I'd take, I'd heed that warning. Mike. Yeah, Billy, you, you have to be smart about it. You can't just, you know, you want to live. I remember after 9-11 people saying, look, you know, you can't uh, live in fear. You have to live, live your life because if you let, if you live in fear and you hide, then the terrorists have won. That is absolutely true. You have to live your life. But it doesn't mean that you can't be smart about it and um, be very careful um, and not be make yourself too much of a vulnerable target. I know that sounds very general, but you, you, know, you always have to be very careful. I am very wary of, um, of, of, of uh, crowds because just of what happened with 9-11. Because uh, after that having been there and seeing all that, that that had happened i you want to get as a police officer into the mind of a terrorist to say what does the world look through their eyes if i was them what would i want to see as a target what would i see as a target what would i want and so then you start thinking ah you know concert halls parks baseball stadiums you know subways you know, all of that stuff so you always try to be very very careful very vigilant and, um, you know, that, you know, see something, say something, you have to do it. You can't worry about uh, political correctness. But, uh, you know, you have to be alert because there are people who don't mind killing vast numbers of people. Uh, we were talking before the show um, back in 2002 during the second Chechnyan war. Che Chechnyan terrorists um, attacked, um, was it a school? Uh, a theater, it's a movie theater. theater. Yeah, and they killed. Uh, uh, they killed 132 hostages. Um, so they died in the attack. Some of them from, from Russian police bullets. Uh, some of them from gas that was, uh, you know, sent in there. Like uh, that was actually uh, like poison gas. But this is, you know, Moscow for all of their security. And we always think we're paranoid. Oh, they, you know, they see everything. You know, um, no, these things can happen because they are very random. I don't think they're they're attached to Ukraine whatsoever. Uh, Ukraine has has uh, tried to blow up things like oil refineries, ammo dumps. I, I think they may have actually taken credit for an attack, a drone attack or something on the Kremlin itself. But I do not think that the anyone in power in Ukraine is looking to uh, kill innocent women and children, you know, totally unrelated, not a military target whatsoever. Perhaps Putin wants to say it because he wants to rally people around a little bit in order to, you know, get your second wind. Let's keep going in uh, Ukraine because this war isn't over by any means. For sure. Pauline Buckles, why did we warn Russia and when did we warn them? Uh, Pauline, I said earlier on March 7th, the State Department issued a warning to Russia that there was chatter about uh, terrorist attacks in Moscow in a concert hall. So they gave them that uh, very information. And uh, I don't know if they ignored it. I don't know really what they did with the information, but the attack occurred. And as I said earlier, you can't possibly protect every soft target in a city. Uh, we've seen that in New York City. How about uh, a couple of years ago, I have the exact um, the exact date when that guy killed like twelve people on the West Side Highway, running them over with a van. Yes, right. I remember uh, that. That's a terrorist act. Also, how can you protect people against that? Uh, and most of the people were were tourists from another mm -hmm. country. Just absolutely horrific. So, did someone know that that guy was going to do that? I don't know. That's what we're talking about, though. If you see something, say something. If you know something, say something. Because potentially, uh, agnostic one, imagine if there was gun holders in the crowd in a Russian theater. Well, you know, that possibly could help. But the other thing is, is these guys had AK-47s. If you got a 9 millimeter going up an AK-40 against an AK-47, I think the 9 millimeter is going to lose, you know. But... Uh, it's better to have it than not have it, but uh, you got to be frugal with how you use it and when you use it, or else you know you're going to be Swiss cheesed. This is um, CNN, a panel on CNN talking about uh, Putin 
and uh, condolences and what and why is he connecting this to Ukraine? What reason is he connecting this to Ukraine? And Putin's statement there. Uh, we've heard other Russian officials imply without evidence that some sort of connection uh, is made there between the terrorists and Ukraine. Uh, why do you believe uh, Putin either believes it or says it? Well, uh, whether he believes it is another question. He's saying it because mm -hmm. uh, their primary mission right now is to convince the Russian people that uh, Putin is absolved of responsibility for either preventing this attack or for the, really, you have to say, botched response. So that's their primary objective. Mm -hmm. And you can see they're having difficulty kind of putting the pieces of this narrative together. But essentially, it all goes back to Ukraine in their view. And President Putin coming out with that kind of indirect statement, you know, crossing the border and a window prepared for them. So it's, it's not really clear, but they want to put the finger on Ukraine and try to go with that narrative. But I think the domestic considerations right now are really, really important. You know, Russians have been through many terror attacks, and once again, they are the victims. And it looks like the government and Putin did not protect them. Hmm. And uh, Kim, uh, the Kremlin says 11 suspects have been arrested so far, including four directly responsible for the attack. Russia's interior ministry was quick to point out that all of the uh, detained suspects are foreign citizens, uh, and um, it is likely that they are also being interrogated about their alleged responsibility. Uh, what kind of messaging does it send to uh, the Russian people? Well, as Jill was saying, that this is not something that Moscow could have foreseen. They're setting up this narrative that outside help was given to carry out this attack. So that even if they do eventually that this was an ice and Khorasan uh, offshoot attack, that somehow the nemesis Ukraine was implicated or at least helped out. Now, Russia has a longstanding battle against ISIS. Um, in Syria, it battled against ISIS on behalf of the Assad regime, which it has continued to support and prop up. And in Afghanistan, you know, Russia is a an ally of the Taliban, and ISIS-K, of course, has been carrying out attacks against the Taliban and anyone allied with the Taliban. Also, the FSB, the Russian State Security Services, have talked about uh, stopping various ISIS plots inside the country. So there's a definite smoking gun here. Uh, they just don't want to talk about that because then the question is, did Putin let his eye off the ball because he was conducting a war of conquest against Ukraine? Mm. And then, John, what is the distinction, if there is one, between uh, ISIS, which is being, um, you know, blamed for earlier attempted uh, attacks, versus this incident, which is being pinned on an ISIS K? So ISIS has been degraded to the point of um, struggling to still exist, but ISIS K or ISIS. Corazon has been the external operations planning for terrorist attacks um, operation within ISIS for a number of years. And even as ISIS has been degraded to the point of nearly disappearing, ISIS Corazon operating in the shadowy regions between Afghanistan and Pakistan with affiliates um, elsewhere in South, uh, South Asia has continued to launch attacks in the name of ISIS. 2022, a suicide bombing against the Russian embassy in Afghanistan. Of course, uh, during the U.S. withdrawal, uh, ISIS-K was um, tagged with responsibility for the devastating suicide bomb attack that killed so many who were trying to flee, as well as U.S. Marines and soldiers. And as Jill points out, um, as Kim points out, um, ISIS-K, uh, the propaganda, the history, has been against Russia, against Afghanistan, against their growing allegiance. So it's a narrative that makes sense. At the same time, Putin has to rewrite that narrative carefully, one that accepts the rest of the intelligence communities of the world may attribute this to ISIS and ISIS-K, uh, but he needs to, to make this more than just a security failure, but try to recast it as Russia's October 7th. Uh, at least cast that there are some Ukraine fingerprints on it. And 
we're seeing those wheels spin today. Mm. And, and then, Jill, this attack comes just a week after the Russian presidential election. Uh, so how will Vladimir uh, Putin, I guess, try to... So obviously Putin is trying to spin this to get political mileage. They just had an election. Mm -hmm. This is a failure of intelligence. This is a failure of security. This is a failure in so many things. And Putin needs to save face, even though, I mean, how viable is an election in the Soviet, in Russia? Well, in right. Russia, I mean, uh, he's going to win no matter what. So it's like... Uh, I don't, I don't see how um, uh, he could say that um, you know, it, this is connected to Ukraine. Yeah, Billy, he's got, he's got to do something to take, you know, to have the shift of focus on the public, because you know, even though he's just won an election, there's a lot of rivals within the, within, I'm sure his own political party and, and you know, other political parties that may have in Russia. He's got to try to recast this. Um, you know, go back and say, yeah, look, 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 you remember they've lost like, I think they've lost like several hundred thousand soldiers or a hundred thousand soldiers already in, a, in, um, in Ukraine. So recasting this to get a second win for the, the uh, country to keep going with this war that is really not a popular war in, in his own country. He's got to do it. He's got to do it. Um, look, we, you know, they gave us excellent information on, on the Sarnaya brothers in 2014. Look what happened. We gave him excellent information um, uh, just like uh, two and a half weeks ago. And look what happened. And this is the sad part is that sometimes this information, especially when it gets to that level, it's been vetted. You know, it's not just uh, one person said something, some errant message on a cell phone and it was picked up. No, this is a numerous chatter over the course of, of probably months. And therefore, we had warned them that within March itself, that there would be a terrorist attack. And it's not like it happened you know, two years from now. No, it happened like uh, a week and a half after we we um, warned them. And so it's it's a real failure. But like everything else, the federal government here and and the, the government in, in Russia, you know, they move so slowly sometimes and there's so much such a bureaucracy that when it comes down to it, who is protecting you? It's really the local police. It's the local police. If they see something at the very end before something happens, um, there's been church shootings in uh, Texas and other places where people have been identified at, or as, as a gunman and it's, they've been taken out before they've had the ability to kill. Um, that's who's really the only people you can count on is that local police officer, but they have to have the training. They have to have the experience. They have to have the funding. You defund the police. There goes the training. Like you said, it's very expensive and the government, you know, the city, the state, the county, they don't want to do it, but you got to have it because we have to be prepared. You know, Semper Paratus, we have to be prepared. Absolutely. Carol Grayston, thank you so much. She gifted five police off the cuff memberships. Thank you so much. It's uh, so touching that you support us in that way. We thank really uh, appreciate it. Folks, this is Police Off the Cuff, Real Crime Stories. If you like real crime, true crime from a police perspective, then you're in the right place. And if you're not subscribed to us, go on our YouTube, hit that subscribe button, give us a thumbs up, ring that bell, hit that like button. Share us with your friends and your family. And if you want to contribute to us financially, we have a Patreon with three different levels. And we also have a YouTube channel membership, which Carol Grayston just gifted five police off the cuff memberships. We have YouTube channel memberships with five different levels. And we appreciate all our friends, all our family, and all our channel members uh, that keep this channel going. And make it what we think is pretty good, a pretty good uh, police channel. You know, I want to play a little bit of another cut by CNN, who they speak to um, former CIA director Brennan. Uh, and let's let's put him on the screen for a second, because everyone, of course, is talking about this right now. And, and really, all of us Americans want to know, how does this affect us, really? How's it going to affect us? Female allied commander and military analyst here, of course, and also CNN contributor 
on Russian affairs, longtime uh, Russia and Moscow Bureau Chief Jill Doherty. So thanks so much to both of you. And Jill, the point where Matthew's saying, right, that uh, Putin is, uh, prides himself and maintains his power by maintaining security. And now you have, in the context of a war, mass mobilizations and many dead, one of the deadliest terror attacks in Russia in decades. Can you put that into perspective? Yeah, you know, I think it's kind of complicated, Aaron, because immediately people who know Russia are going to think of previous uh, incidents, terrorist attacks that were used, exploited by President Putin to take action. It could be cracking down on society, uh, more mobilization, whatever it is. And they go back, and I covered all of them, 1999, yeah. you know, back to 2002, 2004, et cetera. So that's one side of it. But the other side of it is this really looks bad for Vladimir Putin because it is a major attack. And if this is happening on his watch, when he is supposedly the protector of Russia, it, it just pales in comparison. So I think, um, you know, the most important thing now is that we have to watch is who are they going to blame for this? Um, that's number one. And then Blaming somebody, what will they do with that? How will they exploit and use that blame? Yeah, and General Clark, you know, at first there had been, uh, you know, from, from Moscow, the, the slamming of the Kiev regime, uh, you know, so it seemed that that's the direction they were going, right? Blame Ukraine. Um, now, though, ISIS is claiming responsibility and has come out and claimed responsibility, whether they did or didn't do it. Uh, they are claiming it. Is that in line with what you think may have happened? It is in line because I don't think the uh, Ukrainians are going to go after a target like this. I think they go after uh, oil refineries, right. radar sites, military targets. This is clearly a war crime. Uh, they wouldn't do it uh, as much as they're angry at Russia and as much as something like this would bring the war home to the people in, in Moscow who have been relatively supportive of Mr. Putin. But still, I, I think it, the Ukrainian government just wouldn't do this. There's no doubt about Ukrainians working against the Russians. There are attacks in Belgorod. There are Ukrainian agents penetrating Russia. Uh, there's drones coming in. The security in Russia is sort of out of balance, I would guess, from all of this. And as Jill said, Putin's trying to mobilize people and send them to the front. And, and so there's a lot going on there. But this has all the hallmarks of ISIS. And Jill, the, thing, the interesting thing about this is, is that when you talk about the deadliest attack in decades, no matter who perpetrated it, uh, 40 dead, the injured count is going up. The dead count very well may rise significantly. We simply don't know. And yet silence. Putin still has not spoken publicly, has not said anything. Uh, what, what do you make of that? Well, um, also, we have to note that the, the uh, media, the state-controlled media, are not saying much of anything either. So I think right now, in the Kremlin, they are trying to figure out, number one, who did this, and number two, what do they say about it? Because until they say something about it, everyone is frozen in place. There will be a narrative. There will be something that they will say, and then it will be spread all across the media and with all of their officials. But we just have to wait. And General Clark, the U.S. last weekend said within, I believe it was 48 hours, that they thought there could be an attack. They said on public spaces, they mentioned specifically uh, music performances and concert venues. Now, they were wrong in the 48-hour timeline, but a few days later, that exact thing occurred. And they warned. Americans. They publicly put this out there. Apparently, they warned Russia. So wh what do you make of the fact that it still happened? Well, I think that there's still a lot of communications between the United States government and the Russian government. And particularly in, in this case, it sounds like the United States picked up some indicators, uh, either listening or, or informants or something, and passed the information to the Russian government. Uh, ISIS is a, not just a threat to Russia. It's a, a threat beyond Russia. So uh, it's in the United States' interest to take action against ISIS, even if it were going to do a strike in Russia. So, you know, important stuff. Uh, and again, you could see how nations do cooperate, even though if on the surface, more than on the surface, they, they're enemies. Uh, it's in their best interest, perhaps, 
to cooperate with uh, with terrorist warnings. And, and you know, as we, as you said earlier, Mike, we were warned about the Zonayev brothers, who were the two, the Boston Marathon bombers, and we were warned by Russia. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, I, I wonder how many news reporters back then asked, "Why didn't we heed this warning?" You know. Right. We knew about the Zonayev brothers. We knew Tamerlan Zonayev was being trained in a terrorist camp in, in Chechnya. Why didn't we do anything? That's, uh, you know, that's easy to uh, to talk about. Uh, Cheryl F., that sounds so touching, Schmidt. It sounds like you had a great conversation with this officer. Oh, I think you're talking about your cup. I thought it was about what <laughs> we were talking about. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, it's it's so, so important Uh it's so important uh, to, that our government and other governments are warned. They will see you see something, say something, and the news reporters mentioned something also. Is the person who's in charge held directly responsible for the attacks on his country? Was George Bush, who was the president during the 9/11 attack on, of the World Trade Center, was he? seen as inept or was he seen as responsible for these attacks because he didn't prevent them mike bill yeah he had been sworn in in january of 2001 and the tax occurred like nine months later um yeah there i do remember there was some criticism why he didn't uh you know guard our country um he kind of pushed it off on a little bit on the clinton administration because it appeared that going back and looking at, you know, after everything had happened, that the the uh, most of those hijackers, I think it was like 13 altogether, um, they were in this country for well over a year. So that would have fallen in the Clinton administration. So that's how uh, the Bush administration tried to handle it. Um, you know, he was considered, uh, I think, for the vast majority of people, probably not as a perpetrator or uh, you know, sleep at the wheel, but certainly, you know, he was seen when he rallied people together and Congress passed the uh, authorization to use military force within uh, like, a, like two weeks of the attack. Uh, he was seen then as a leader. And um, so that was huge. But uh, yeah, it depends on, I think, really how the media portrays it, what, what people's uh, feelings are, because every president or, or like the premier or prime minister, whatever, uh, you know, Putin's title really is, they're always going to call on their friends to back them up and to protect them from criticism. Well, but of course, you know, you've got to deal with this. And he was warned, he was caught flat footed. Um, maybe the security services are such a bureaucracy that they couldn't respond quick enough. But uh, yeah, there's always going to be people, no matter what, who will uh, accuse the, the leader of being uh, negligent and, and actually blaming them. Um, you know, so it depends. We'll see how it goes. Um, how is the next six months going to play out in the Ukraine? You know, that sort of thing. What's going to be, is there going to be another attack on a, another soft target? Russia is a huge country. You know, it's bigger than the United States in terms of the land mass. It's probably the United States and, and uh, Canada combined. It's got a huge population, huge infrastructure. Um, if it happens similarly again, that would be different. But if this is the only one, he probably will easily survive this politically and just keep on going. Absolutely. This is how uh, CBS uh, News this morning reported on this. 15 people were killed. Russian news reports said the four camouflage-clad gunmen stormed the venue and fired point-blank at the hundreds of people who gathered for a rock concert. The attackers also set the concert hall on fire and caused the roof to partially collapse. The U.S. said it recently warned Russia about the threat of the Islamic State group attack targeting large gatherings in the Moscow area. Deborah Pata is following the latest developments just outside Russia's capital. There was pandemonium and terror as armed men dressed in combat fatigues burst into Crocker City Hall on the outskirts of Moscow, opened fire and set the complex alight. 
The brazen attack took place as crowds gathered at the popular concert venue and shopping mall for a performance by a veteran Russian rock band. Videos posted on social media show people screaming and ducking for cover as the gunmen fired volley after volley of automatic gunfire. The shots were constant, eyewitness Dave Primov said. People panicked and started to run. Some fell down and were trampled on. Others were trapped in a basement and escaped by bashing down an exit door. Another video shows the assailants moving with deadly intent through the mall, firing incessantly, often at point-blank range. The extent of horror made clear by the growing line of body bags. The images are just horrible um, and uh, just hard to watch. And our thoughts, obviously, are going to be with the, the victims of this terrible, terrible shooting attack. The building was engulfed in flames with smoke billowing from the massive blaze, Russia's equivalent of the FBI dispatched investigators to the scene. The U.S. Embassy recently warned about the threat of terrorist attacks in Moscow, advising Americans to stay away from concert venues, and the State Department says the intelligence was shared with Russia. So there you go. Uh, the intelligence was shared with with Russia. I mean, you can't even when when you watch something like that. I think we we've become so desensitized to violence from seeing it on television and movies. Uh, live, we saw it live during nine eleven, right? Sure. Uh, well, we've seen it live in our police careers too. We've seen real violence, and real live violence is very ugly when you see it. Sort of desensitized when you watch it secondhand on television or in a movie theater. It's not the same. And it's really ugly when you see re real, real violence. And then, you know, as I said, when people watch this, it's sort of, th it's on a movie screen. It's on their computer screen. And it's not, it's not the same thing. It's, it's really not your thoughts, Mike. Yeah, Billy, there's nothing like being uh, shot at to uh, clear all the cobwebs in your head. Um, you've had that happen to me. I've had that happen to me. Phil's ha had it happen to him. Um, you know, what you see on your, on your screen, your laptop, your phone, even though it's terrible and you know it's not a, a, a movie where, you know, The Rock is going to come in and save people, it's not nearly as, um, as, as, as uh, powerful as when you're there um, having the bullets, you know, hit really close by you. Um, uh, you really cannot imagine the terror and the PTSD that these people are going to have for a while who were there. They, you know, they saw uh, people there just, you know, a lot of young uh, Russians just wanting to enjoy some music. They weren't doing anything wrong, weren't doing anything like that, you know, and uh, they're not drug dealers on the street corner shooting it out at three o'clock in the morning. These just people just want to, uh, you know, listen to some good music. And other young Russians are just getting shot down, like they say, point blank range as people are just walking around with an AK-47. They know they are not going to be opposed. The only thing people are doing is actually running away or ducking. Nobody's actually trying to go on the offense and, and attack them. They know it. So they are completely in control. And that is absolutely terrifying for those people. And that is something that they will live with for a long time. But uh, yeah, uh, it doesn't ever, ever, no matter how you know great your sound system is, no matter how big your television is or whatever, that screen, nothing compares to the real thing. And that's something that stays with you forever. 100%. You know, and I just want to uh, uh, make something clear also. When we mentioned earlier that when these uh, attacks, these inevitable attacks that are going to happen in our country, in the United yeah. States, the people that are going to respond to this are the police. Mm -hmm. They're going to be the ones out there 24-7. So why are we beating them down? Why are we making them like almost like conscientious objectives? You don't want them to do their job. When something like this happens, you're going to see who the real police are, you know? And unfortunately, in New York City, the politics is, is really... I don't know, just beating the police down. That's all I could say. Uh, 
you get something like this that happens in New York City, and you need a professional, professional police report. Well, look, I happen to think the world of our emergency service unit. And oh, in great. most places um, in the country, they call them SWAT. You right. don't dare do that in New York City. You call emergency service SWAT in New York City, they'll tell you we're not, a, we're not SWAT. We're emergency service. And they'll tell you that right up because to them, SWAT is like a California thing. Right. And it stands for um, – uh, special special weapons. weapons and tactics. Yeah, ESU doesn't want to be known as that. They want to be called emergency. Well, we're emergency. And when there's an emergency, you know, there's the old expression. And I used to always say it to ESU cops when they came on the scene. I used to say, when the public's in trouble, they call the police. When the police are in trouble, they call emergency service. <laughs> no, true. true. And these guys get their heads swell up. They go, yeah, you're right, Sarge. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and, and it, but it's true. Schmitty, thank you so much for the $5 super sticker. An officer engaged in conversation with me yesterday at length. He wants to extend a thank you, my brothers, to you. You are noticed. You are respected. Schmitty, thank you so thank much. You. We appreciate that. Thank you know, you. Uh, you know they, they say sometimes that being a cop is a thankless job. Uh, I don't want to say that about police off the cuff. No. We get all kinds of thanks from you guys. We get all kinds of love, no. and we we really appreciate that. I thought a little bit about uh, twice about covering this story. I know it's uh, it's sort of not not going to be a popular story with YouTube. I can tell you that much. Um, but I think it's an important story, you know. Yeah. And whenever we can say, if you see something, say something. Uh, we know we know how important that is. Uh, Lieutenant Peter Pranzo, ESU, anywhere, anytime. You're right, Lieutenant Pete. They have that right. little rabbit with the gun going in his holster, and he's got holding it up. You say, anywhere, anytime. You're right. You're right, Lieutenant Pete. That's so important. And I can tell you my career as an NYPD police sergeant, ESU, saved us many times. And uh, not just on, like, dangerous jobs, but jobs where we needed them to take a door to discover what was behind that door. One time, this girl took a drug overdose, and uh, my cops are trying to tell me, oh, she's not there. I go, she's not there because she's unconscious. And I had the issue come in and take the door, and sure enough, if we didn't take that door, she would have died. So little stories like that, you know, knocking that, knocking a door down and finding someone that was murdered on the other side, you know, things like that. And then, of course, you know, when you do have a dangerous job with weapons or an EDP, emotionally disturbed person, ESU other guys to go to. And uh, again, every sergeant, every lieutenant, every captain, every police officer on the NYPD has great stories, great warmth um, for, for emergency service because uh, they save your ass numerous, numerous times. And that's, that's no joke. Folks, if you're looking... For a great attorney in the New York metropolitan area, then Joe Murray is your man. Joe's a retired NYPD police officer and a fantastic defense attorney. You can reach Joe on his cell phone at 718-514-3855. Email him at joe at jmurray-law.com. Go on his website, jmurray-law.com. Uh, not only is Joe a great attorney, but he's a huge supporter. There he is on the screen. Huge supporter of the Police Off the Cuff podcast. I'm actually trying to get Joe to come on the show again. He's been absent for a while. He's a, he's a busy, busy attorney, but uh, hopefully he'll be coming on soon. Um, you know, I, I don't know what more to say about this case, except it's just, uh, as, Mike, as Mike Geary said, uh, these attacks, it's not uh, if – it's when. Sure. And so many people said that after 9-11. And guess what? That happened. And not that we wish it to happen. We don't wish it to happen. But it's called preparation. Preparedness. Preparedness. And you may argue that we're not as prepared as maybe we should be. The other thing is in New York City, you know, would they take a terrorist like this and, and let them out on bail? <laughs> I'm horrified. I have no confidence in the district attorney's office in any of the five boroughs, you know. So they've been so tainted by politics. And um, 
police put them in and the DA's office lets them out. Right. So, uh, Mike, you know, all I can say is uh, your final words. Okay. Final words. People should realize that even though this happened, you know, 4,000 miles away or whatever it is, this is absolutely related to us. And uh, these terrorists, uh, ISIS, ISIS-K, they don't like us any any less than they like than they dislike the, us any less than they dislike russia they would love to take part something down an airliner blow up a school attack an embassy overseas um you know they this is what they live for this makes them go to heaven they believe they could take out infidels like you and me um that makes their day so this is absolutely applicable to us and I think part of the problem for New York City people is it's really hard not to live in New York City and not be around crowds. I mean, taking the four train, five train, you know, six train, whatever, uh, from the Bronx into Manhattan, you know, uh, every, every day you're packed in like sardines and you just think about what can happen. So we are vulnerable, but we have to keep our wits about ourselves and keep our eyes open. And we and uh, we have to do that. We have to live our lives as best we can, but we have to be realists. And I think that's the thing. Greatest thing about being a police officer is it makes you a realist because you see the people doing the greatest things, helping total strangers in a city of New York where everybody thinks uh, New York's New Yorkers are uncaring. And at the same time, you see people doing the worst things to each other. And it's amazing what people can do, what uh, good and bad in this world when they are so motivated. So thank you, everyone, for tuning in and uh, just keep your eyes open. Absolutely. Dr. Vinny Bumbats, Professor Geary is a man's man. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> thank Agnostic, you. Agnostic one. Born and raised in New York City, I'm happy I moved out and sad about what my city has become. You know, Agnostic one. I feel exactly the same way, you know. H. Cook, that is horrible to think New York DA would, DA would let them go. Yeah, but we've seen them let uh, a group of guys that beat up two cops, kick them on the ground, and he, we've seen them let them go. That was, I have no faith in Alvin Bragg, the Manhattan District Attorney. No faith whatsoever. And some of the other boroughs, they know better. It's, it's this woke society we're looking at right now, and it's disgusting. So sorry to feel that way, but I absolutely do feel that way. And um, it's sort of pathetic, but that, that is, that, you know, that's what it is. So folks, thank you so much for tuning in tonight. I'm Bill Cannon from Police Off the Cuff, Real Crime Stories. Have a great night. And we'll see you the next time. Good night. One episode, just